What's up, YouTube? I'm Vaughn, and this is the Gear Channel where we discuss collectibles, hobbies, compare games from tabletop to video games. And today we have a very special episode because we have our first guest coming actually here to the studio. So make sure to definitely like and subscribe. But I do have to apologize for the audio because we are having a little bit of an issue. But I'm trying to resolve that as fast as possible. Now for today's guest, he is a level 2 judge for the card game Magic the Gathering and he is really well known in the Montreal community. Here is Eric Pae. And how are you doing today, Eric? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Uh, anytime or it's a pleasure to have you here. Now the first question I have is what is exactly a judge, especially a level 2 judge for Magic the Gathering? So uh, a Magic the Gathering judge works at Magic tournaments to run them, uh, to officiate them. What I'll do, my job is I will be on the tournament floor uh, ask, answering questions that players have about the rules during their matches or out, even outside of their matches. They might have questions about policy or they might need to know where the, where the bathroom is, where to, where to go for if there's going to be a lunch break. I can answer all those questions. I'm, I'm, I'm there to help the players. And what's like the difference between a level one and level two, like judge? So when, uh, when a person becomes a magic judge, they start at level one. And a level one judge is working the, uh, we're working the smaller tournaments at their local game store. They already, their friends know that they're a judge now. They, when, when they have questions, they know that they can ask that player with confidence that uh, what, they're, uh, what, they, uh, for, what the answer will be. Okay, and how many levels are there? Is it just uh, level two, or is it like four or five? There's three, there's three there's levels, actually. Okay. So, and uh, after level one, you get, to be, you get to go to level two. You have to take a, a harder test have to judge more tournaments and need recommendation more recommendations from uh with for, from others uh particularly higher level judges and organizers of tournaments to approve you to be a, a, a higher level judge and you'll be working the larger scale tournament particularly the magic fest okay and what about like just what is like the process just be a level one judge like what do you have to do just to open that door to put like your third in like what is like the process is it just like a simple exam for that or do you still need a recommendation just to be a level one judge as well you need the recommendation what we call it now for level one is an endorsement so the process now is to go on what's called the magic judge academy on the internet this is a for-profit organization that is affiliated with Wizards of the coast uh, they're not actually Wizards of the coast themselves they're just they're just they just work with them and Magic Judge Academy, take they manage uh, you know the archives of all the rules, the policy. They also take care of all the testing. If a if a person wants to become a judge, they go to the academy. They go on the academy website to take the to take the, the online tests. Okay. And and then after they take the test, after they after they take the policy and they they pass all the exams. Then they must be endorsed by a, a level two, level three judge. So what is they will enter the the judge, the higher level judge will interview the candidate, and if the interview goes well, if they say that the candidate is fit or appropriate to be a, a judge, they will click on a check mark and endorse on the academy website, and they become a judge. Okay, because like one thing about like magic is that. It's very intimidating and even for like a lot of like the hobbies that we do on the channel and try to introduce like new players to different games or into like collectibles. It's like I haven't started doing any magic uh, videos because it just seems too intimidating. There's a bunch of rulings so it must be like very impressive that you know like a bunch of the rulings to be a judge but it's like for someone just to even start the game because there's different formats and everything, what is the proper step for someone to take for them to start like this brand new TCG game? Oh, I'd say the first thing is to visit your local game store that sells Magic the Gathering and ask how to play. 
And it's pretty simple because the how to play decks are they're very basic. They use only the basic rules. And when you play Magic the Gathering with your friends, you don't need to know all the rules. I know the Magic rule book is very complex. I don't know how many pages there are exactly, but I will say there are well, maybe a lot more than 200 pages just for the comprehensive rules. You also have the tournament rules, you also have the, the procedure guide. There's, there, there's other documents, but the rule book itself is a very large document. But fortunately, for every player does not know need to know the entire rule book A to Z. Especially if you're only playing at your local game store, only playing at your kitchen table. And does those rules like change depending on the format that you choose? Or what would be like the best format? Like if I wanted to start playing like Magic, what would be like the best format for me to start with? It will depend on the people you play with. And the rules won't change depending on the format. They just, you just... You, the older formats will use more rules. Uh, more current formats will use less rules. Okay. You'll have to remember. You'll have to remember fewer rules and fewer uh, common interactions when you're you, when you're playing in newer formats. Okay. And what would be like the best like format for me to choose from? Because I know like I pretty much know that there was modern. That's like uh, you guys have like the cycle of like the sets. Probably not. Like, if you could explain that better than me, then please go right ahead. <laughs> but like, yeah. I know like uh, there's like set like rotations that you do for modern. I know EDH is like Highlander, but like it has another name. Is it still called EDH or is like Commander format? Or? EDH is Commander. Okay. Uh, so it gave, the format began as EDH, which stands for Elder Dragon Highlander, yeah. and then Wizards of the Coast branded the format. Uh, rebranded the format as Commander. Okay, and because that I remember that you were allowed to play one of each card in the deck except for like basic lands yep. that you were allowed as many, and then you had to match it with the attributes of well with the colors of your commander, and that was like the only time I was like playing like Magic, but it was such like a short period of time. Like, where it'd be best for me to like go back and do like playing EDH or should I go and start playing like modern or is there other formats that I should like explore to like see? If you are playing only for fun, you can play any format really because you, Magic is supposed to be just a fun game with your friends. As a matter of, fa as a matter of fact, I would say more than 90% of all Magic games played anywhere are just for fun. Tournaments, competitive tournaments only make up a small percentage of all of all magic games around the world and how many formats does magic have because i know with like a lot of like other games like Yu-Gi-Oh pretty much has like two and then they're starting a third one that's getting like popularized but i know pokemon has like four like how many does like magic have? magic has plenty i don't know the number off the top of my head i'll have to count it out for you right now well, what's so, like the name of each one uh, I'll, that's all i'll count yeah. out so we have standard we have Pioneer, we have Modern, we have Legacy, we have Vintage, and we have the other one that we were speaking about is Commander, which is one I'll, I'll speak about the most because that's probably my favorite format. There's also uh, other, there's also another other format called Draft, Booster Draft, or Sealed Deck. And those two that I just mentioned, you don't need to have your own cards at the start of the day. You don't have to bring your, you don't have to prepare your own deck. In those in those two formats, the or organizer of the tournament provides you with the product. So you will open the cards, you open your booster packs at the table when you start when you start a tournament, and you will build your deck to play with from only that card pool. No, oh, okay. So you don't need to have your you don't have to start with your own collection for that tournament. As a matter of fact, that you it used to just be that used to, that didn't really wasn't a format. It was just something people did in between uh in, in, in between constructed formats but now it's become it's now it's become their own formats and they're, they're part they used to be part of the the magic pro tour when it existed or the the magic pro not the pro league but higher level tournaments used to now still will probably will still when it comes back after the pandemic will now will still run booster draft tournaments and sealed deck tournaments so this way, players don't need to always bring their own decks. They can all they have to build their own decks from a lim very limited card pool, 
formats, and that is cha more challenging than people would, would realize. The other formats that I talked about, standard, pioneer, and so on, those are constructed formats, that, and that means the players have to come to the tournament with their own deck ahead of time. So they will take their collection that they have at home or wherever and build their deck from there. Right. What's the difference between standard and modern? They're not the same. Oh, absolutely not. What's the difference between those? Because so standard is a rotating format. So not like modern. Not like modern. Modern doesn't rotate. No. Nope. So every uh, every September, which is like this month, we have uh, we will have sets from the previous two years that will that that will no longer be legal in the format, and at the same time, the new the newest set will become legal. And then after that, in January, when they release the next set, uh, the next uh, standard legal set of Magic, that will become legal in the in the standard format. It, their cards will be added to their card pool, and then so on. In March or I think it's April or May when the third set, then summer is the last set, and then it goes back to the next September, and then the four sets that came out the two years before that will be will be will no longer be allowed. So the, the the card pool is always changing. It's just cards not only cards are being added, but cards are being removed from it. I thought modern was the same thing. Like no. uh, they rotate like the sets out. Not in modern. So pioneer and modern, and legacy and vintage, in those four in those four set in those four formats, they only they only add new cards, but they never, but they never rotate out older cards. So, legacy and vintage; those are the old, oldest formats. You call those eternal. They use cards from as old, from as long as when Magic began in the Alpha set. They they have their own ban list, or in case of vin in vintage, a restricted list. Uh, but generally, the uh, complete sets are not banned. Okay. In modern, however. You can only play with cards that are printed at an 8th edition and onward, which 8th edition I believe was as of 2003. So Modern includes cards printed as of 2003. Uh, Pioneer is similar, but it only includes part cards printed as of Return to Ravnica in 2012. Okay, so, clearly I don't know what the fuck I was talking about when I was talking about Modern. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, it's, that's rotate. It's like, no, apparently not even that. Alright, so that's standard, okay? Yeah. Damn. Now, definitely, like, you must have, like, a few, like, to take on, like, when it comes to, like, policies and rulings with, like, magic, what is, like, is there any policies or rulings that you're not either too fond of or you disagree with that the uh, magic, like, has? Because, like, but, like, other, like, TCG games, like, for Yu-Gi-Oh!, there was a few that I like this uh we on. Was there any like that you find for like magic as well? I haven't given this much thought recently because during the pandemic I haven't really been thinking about uh, judge stuff. Yeah. And it's been a very long time since, since I've been judging. But it's not certain rulings. It's more of just the uh there is one case that actually happened uh, in a tournament I actually was at a tournament yesterday and it happened there I won't I won't comment on a particular tournament mm -hmm. but in general it's when uh, some a player does something and then immediately says oh I take it back or if let's say they are about to let an action happen and they realize they had they, they have something in play that will let them let's say negate that action and they, all of a sudden they say, oh wait, hold on, I have this, so this sh I'll, I'll deny that from, from taking effect. And the opponent says, well no, you already, you already started taking the action, so it's too late to roll back, it's, it's, too, it's too late to go back. And then it comes down to an, a bit of an argument at the table because the players are competitive at one another and they, they want to win, so they, they, they don't want the other player, they, they, they don't want to take back, one player doesn't want to take back to happen, the other player wants to take back to happen because it's for them. But... And we're, I don't like that because I, I'm I'm all about okay, not much has happened in the game. I'll, I'll, I'll let you take back your thing. Because in the end, Magic is it's, it's a card game. Competitive, it, it is competitive. I, I will respect that you can have competitive Magic that's played for a lot of money 
and in those cases we can't allow such take backs yeah, because like higher tier events, it's a like, higher tier event yeah. but we can't let that mentality uh, spill into even the lower tiers because that just that doesn't make the game fun because in uh, Yu-Gi-Oh we have something very similar so like well, for that, it's like, in the actual, like, game, we have that ruling also. It's like, for taking back, like, moves once the card is placed, or if there was any form of confirmation on, like, both ends that both players, like, agree on, you can't take back uh, that play. Yeah. And nowadays, like, with a lot of, like, community, they label, like, if you don't allow your opponent to take it back your play, you are labeled as, like, a shark, which was based on another ruling that we have for rule shocking but a lot of players nowadays are in misinterpreting that as sharking but in reality it's just like the mechanic of the game but it's like the idea of like this ruling came up was because like a lot of players allow their opponents to cheat intentionally so then later on they could call a judge so they could penalize them for that uh, mistake that they made before and that's why this rule was like built for it and like magic do you have like similar like rulings for that as well for like players or actually do you have that type of community of like some players that are trying to enforce like winning games based on like penalties or cheating that their opponents did as well i wouldn't say it, it could have been back in the past the rules a magic policy now is written so that a player can't really take advantage of another player's mistake to get a game win out of it. But in Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, so a rule shark, if they attempt, someone who would attempt to rule shark their opponent in the way that's described in the, in the Yu-Gi-Oh rules, and it was caught by a judge, what would the Yu-Gi-Oh judge do to the uh, player who's the rule shark? What's the well, they were actually, well, depending on it, they were either received a game loss, max loss, or a disqualification. Depends on the history of it. It's not really, like, they won't receive a disqualification off the bat of that. But if it's, like, a reincurring with this specific player at this event, then, yes, that would be definitely, like, no The only difference is, is banning. Because if they have, because usually for penalties to accumulate to go into like actual like game losses max loss or disqualification it all has to accumulate in that one event but for banning it has to do with accumulation of multiple uh, events so like if you do it multiple times in one single event still not good but for banning it doesn't have to be just one event. If you did it every single time, kept on getting penalized for this specific uh, reason, then you could actually get banned from it. So they have to investigate, but that's why the issue is, is that uh, I'll give you one of the best examples. So like me, I'm labeled a shark and it started with this one ruling, okay? And it was because my opponent had a mark sleep. Now this was before the match begins, okay? okay? So he has a mark sleeve and it's a big gash line on the back of the card. Like you can see it like a mile away. So I asked my opponent if he could replace the sleeve. He said no. I asked him two more times. He still didn't want to. It's been like four minutes now. I call a judge. Call the judge. He won't change the sleeve and it's marked. Just uh, issued him a warning and forced him to change the sleeve. After that he labeled me as a shark because I called the judge for that. Which, in reality, that's not sharky. Because also, I actually, like, gave him a chance to, like... Yes. I like, said. So, that's how the laboring, like, definitely starts. But that's also, like, the biggest misinterpretation that a lot of people have on sharky. But the first thing that the judge asked when he came to the table, though, was... When were you aware of the mark sleeve? And that is very crucial, because... The thing that would determine if I was sh like actually rule sharking or not, well one, I noticed this right away, call a judge, this was before the game. If I was rule sharking, what I would have done is notice the mark sleeve, commence the game, go into like game one, game two, and then when I'm at a disadvantage, call a judge and tell them that he has a mark sleeve. That would be literally the definition of rule sharking is that I literally take advantage of 
a penalty that's in the Konami policy. But it's like, what I did was the complete opposite. I noticed it, said it to the judge right away, gave my opponent a chance, and get labeled a shark. So that's why, like, when it comes to it, like, world sharking, or what do you have, like, in magic, it's a different term? Cheating. But you have, like, another term for, like, Rules lawyer. Rules lawyer, yeah. In your case, it wouldn't be considered much of a rules lawyer as much of a cheater. Alright. So, yeah... You you called out the Mark's leap as soon as you noticed it. You yeah. didn't you didn't hold on to the you didn't hold on to it until it, until you bring up it at a more advantageous time. In Magic the Gathering, in poli- according to policy, that it would be cheating if you notice an infraction that your opponent commits or you commit by accident and you choose to not bring it to the attention of a judge. Okay. And does that like come up a lot when it comes to like? magic events or is that like a very rare occasion i would say it's a very rare occasion because in my experience i've only to deal with it maybe uh a handful of like one i count on one how many times i had that incident come up okay. i won't speak to the specific incidents but i will say that yes players like I, my players expect uh, i expect my players to know that if you if, if you see your opponent commit a pro uh, uh in-game infraction, or you do one by mis- by accident, call the judge right away so that it becomes noticed and it doesn't become a problem later on. A good example is, um, you, if you see your your opponent in the sh- has an indestructible creature, which means the creature cannot die, yeah. and you play a spell that kills every creature in play at the same time, it should not kill that indestructible creature. However, your opponent is absent-minded and doesn't notice that when they pick up all of their creatures that are not indestructible to put into their graveyard, which is the discard pile, they also pick up their indestructible creature box and they, they, take it off of, they take it off of the game board. It's no longer a problem for you as the opponent. It's more advantageous for you to not say anything, but you have to call it out. And instead, and if you don't call it out and, and you try to hold on to your unfair advantage, you cheat it. Yeah. And that in magic, that is penalty of disqualification. If if you if we discover that you that you knew about that problem and you chose not to say anything about it. Now, can it lead toward? Is it like the maximum like penalty is disqualification, or can you actually get banned as well? Well, yeah, the penalty is disqualification. And yes, afterward you can be suspended from organized play for uh, a, ter- a determined amount of time. It could be between six months to maybe three or four years, depending on the situation. And of course, you have repeat situations like you described the earlier. They can lead to even longer, even longer suspensions. Because like for like rule sharking is very real to see. Like even for me to come across like like there's only like one time I actually saw like legit shark all the other times that you hear like sharking it's not actual rule sharking it's just like the misinterpretation that everyone like more of the newer players are like calling it now but it's very rare that you actually see someone like rule shark you see it down like maybe like G but rule sharking is like completely different character but actually that actually reminded me because I want to hear like your input on when it's rulings that has to do with more of like a trusting like card tech so instead of actually reading the card yourself you are relying more on your opponent to explain what the card does but what's like the ruling if your opponent either mis- mislead you in like the card text or they did not point out any effects that were benefit you so we have what's called the communication policy guide uh, we have communication policy written in the magic com- in the magic tournament rules it's a section on just communication, and that section it dictates what players are ex- what players must tell their opponents on what they're allowed to not say. In general, what I will say is that there are some there's some there's some information that as a player, if your opponent asks you about, you don't have to answer it. Their exceptions are uh, card names. If your opponent asks for a card name, you must answer it. If your opponent asks for what what phase or step the game is in, you must answer it. That's the name of a few examples. Okay. But in general, if your opponent asks for a, a calculation, or if they asks for uh, what uh, 
what the what these cards do when they interact with one another, you don't have to answer it. However, if you choose to give an answer, you, it cannot be a lie. So you can't actively try and mislead your opponent. So you can't tell your opponent, if they ask about how two cards work together, you can't say, oh, it works when these two cards change zones or when these two cards, uh, or, or when I play this other card with these cards in play. And it turns out that you were, you were kind of lying, you were kind of trying to be deceitful. That's, that's where it's wrong. You're not allowed to, if you choose to give up, if you choose to answer your opponent about any questions they have, you can't lie. Or one you exception have to give though. The full text though. No, nope. the full text you can keep to yourself because uh, the full text is always available to players through Oracle. Oracle is a Magic the Gathering uh, archive on the internet of every card in existence, and it's updated text. So if they change uh, if they change text on cards to a, so that's more in line with uh, current uh, Magic rules or policy. They it will appear in the updated text online, so it will be different from what's written on the physical card. Okay. And all players have access to this even during games. Oh yeah. They can call a judge, ask for Oracle text as it as we call it, and the judge will provide it. Okay, because like one thing that we have is that like whenever a situation like that occurs, so I'll give you one of the best example. There is a card that like pretty much it destroys up to two monsters, whoever monster it is. Uh, I do that is destroyed. You draw a card for each one. So, like, as for what is the card text, they said, oh, destroys two cards. But does not mention the benefit part on your end. So, you're saying that would be, in a way, misleading? Or is it still true because he did state what it actually does, but he did not bring the rest of it? But when you answer, is it the full text that you have to answer? It's not the full text to answer. Like you say, if it, it just destroys two creatures, but it has an this additional effect, they didn't say they didn't lie. They just omitted information. And that well, what I will say now is when you bring that up, if you're playing in the lower tier tournaments like Friday Night Magic, which no, is we're, we're talking about higher tier. Higher, higher tier, tier, yeah. Higher you don't, you don't have to answer the whole card. Oh no. Your opponent, yeah. Players are expected to know the cards or call or call for a judge to look up Oracle. That's it. very encouraged. Oh, okay. If you don't know what a card does, look up, ask for the oracle. We'll be happy to provide it, so there'll be no more confusion. But in the lower tiers where a judge won't be present naturally, uh, if you ask your opponent about what a card does that's in play, they do have to answer it completely and honestly. Okay. So that because they can't, if they keep it to themselves, and the player who's asking the question can't get any help from, let's say, there's no judge, or they don't have a phone available to look up oracle, there's no resource. It's really not that fair. So in that case, we ask the oppo we ask the opponent that if you're playing in lower level tournaments, you're supposed to give complete answers. Okay. Now, they accept the one info. What I want to clear up is that the only time you can the only time you can let's say lie is when you're bluffing about cards in your hand because that's hidden information. Oh yeah. Obviously, if, if I ask you, do you have an island or a forest in your hand, and you say no. But, or let's say I ask you about cards in your hand and you say, no, I don't have the card, but you do. Obviously, it's bluffing because it's hidden information. Yeah. If it's, what we're talking about earlier is cards in play that the, all players can see. That's public. Yeah. So, you can't necessarily lie about that because it's in play. Yeah, Yu-Gi-Oh! has the same policy. You cannot even mislead a card or you cannot voluntarily reveal private knowledge. So, let's say I have a card that were stuff like your, your play and everything. Yeah. And I reveal it to you. It's like that we're actually issue a game loss because one, it actually changes your whole combo because now you are aware of this private knowledge and you cannot reveal private knowledge voluntarily. Or you cannot bluff or mislead opponent with like cards that you don't have either. Everything that's private is supposed to remain private even if you're lying about it or telling the truth about it. What happens if you drop a card and it comes revealed by accident? If your opponent sees the card, you if drop. it's by accident, that's not uh, revealing private mo uh, knowledge voluntarily. Okay. If it's by accident, then it's an accident, and that's okay. But if you actually do it on purpose, especially to change like your opponent's mentality or his place, then yes, that is an uh, issue. Okay. In Magic, we don't have that. No, no. We're allowed to just show our, our whole hand to our opponent. Really? Yeah. We can't show the top card of our deck unless you know what it is, obviously, because that's, that's hidden from both of us. But, like, the bluffing thing isn't, like, close to the same 
category? It's bl- well, it's bluffing, but at the same time, it's information you have that you can still show your opponent. And during the game, if you think you can beat your opponent with the hand you have during the middle of the game, it's you can start going and say, hey, I'll show you my hand. Do you want to go in the next game? Do you want to quit? Because I'm going to win with this hand. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, well, that's definitely different. Shit. That's good to know. Now, the oracle that you mentioned, okay, that you have access to now, is the primary reason for that is because you guys are allowed playing, like, different languages of cards at, like, higher tier events? Or is that, like, not true? Like, you guys always have to play, like, English cards? Because I see sometimes, like, people play with, like, Japanese cards, Italian cards. Are you allowed those at high tier Absolutely. Oh, yeah? We're even allowed uh, cards with artistic modifications, so altered cards. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Sure. The exception is, your so there are standards that the cards have to maintain. If you're using a card that is altered from its original uh, printing, so you, it's been painted on, the card has to, so the name or the mana cost can't be changed nor obscured in any way. The, the art, uh, the illustration can't be, mis- it can't be a misleading card. You can't make misleading pictures, so you can't, let's say you can't take a card that has a dragon on it and paint a, uh, like a, a teddy bear, because that's misleading. Because for Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, especially for alternative like cards, there is actually a lot of like rule based on like. Me, I know this because I used to make like a ton for like Yu-Gi-Oh. But uh, definitely for the image. But there's a lot of times for like expanding like the image. There's still a lot of rules that applies. Like you still have to show like the card text, the level. There is still a lot of like Konami information on the cards that you still have to keep revealed. So it's a big like minimum amount of stuff that you can actually do not much but something i see like magic cards have like the whole art like expanded but then no tax like are those still allowed at the absolutely oh yeah yeah if there are some because there's many cards that are that don't have text on them they're just one complete picture they've they're which is the coast uh official cards but what about like uh like with all like the thing where that definitely changes like the weight of the card like isn't that is considered no no and that's not 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 to a noticeable extent Oh yeah. If you're yeah, so older ca- cards from uh, an older card, let's say ninety two, ninety four, might have darker Magic: The Gathering backs, and they have to be played with uh, with opaque sleeves. Mm-hmm. So some cards might have more squared corners, and the uh, reason that you might use sleeves and nowadays when we're all using uh, card sleeves in our with our decks, it's harder to notice any differences in any minute differences in Magic cards. In their, yeah, fi- in their physical like, in their tech, physical appearance yeah, unless if it's like texture in the back of the card yeah that would be like, or like or more or in the more common cases cards that curve because they're foiled and uh, they've been exposed to the elements or a card that's been it's gone wet uh, it's gone soaked and it's now crimpled okay. or or physical damage to a card that might make it noticeable even in the sleeve I know like uh, for like a lot of games like that is definitely not allowed and also like one thing is like the weight factor of it like that is considered like even for like Yu-Gi-Oh we had like a few cards that is no longer allowing like uh, high tier events because of like the foiling that was used on them made the cards a lot heavier and it was easy to actually like uh, stack your deck with because of that 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 sounds like uh that that sounds like something the the, the people who printed the the kind of printed the cards. It's not the fault of the player who bought the cards. Because hmm. cool. uh, in the case I described, that's usually it's after the, the cards are bought, it's the owner's responsibility to maintain uh, their playability. They can't let them get ruined in any way. No. Okay. But in your case, you described that the cards uh, if the cards are printed to be heavier than other cards. That doesn't sound like it's not the player's fault. It's not the owner's fault. The, they bought them. They bought the packs. They opened the packs. They found the cards like that. Now, like speaking about buying cards, so there's been a lot of debate on like which one's more expensive, which is the most expensive like game to actually start. And ideally, like a lot of people, like I always hear two sides. One that they say like Magic is very expensive. Okay. And the other one says that it's actually very cheap. Now, the expensive side is because they are referring cards like Black Lotus and all those. So, obviously. 
but the other side of things very cheap is that you could actually build a good deck for like three dollars or less and you can still play at competitive events and beat even decks that are worth way more than that mm -hmm. so yeah the po it's that is possible but when you were talking about playing competitive events you will need to spend a lot of money to have at least a good competitive deck. Now, what's like a lot of money to get started in playing this? I um, haven't looked at the numbers uh, lately. I do know that but for the pandemic, uh, it would cost you close to maybe... Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. I might be wrong because I haven't played Modern well, for wait, a long time. Which like, format are you talking about? Modern. Modern? Okay. Modern is, I think, is not the most expensive format per se. But it is nonetheless an expensive format. Well, which one's you the want... cheapest? Standard? Uh, I would say it's standard. Well, the cheapest would be, let's say, Booster Draft, because you're just paying for packs. Okay. But you might open uh, cards that are in the end or aren't worth as much as the packs you paid for. Okay. But if a constructed format standard would kind of be the, the cheapest if you, if, you buy your, if you buy your first deck. Okay. But standard, you're always buying cards, new cards. You have to always buy new cards because your older cards no longer good. What about EDH? Because I remember my deck was pretty cheap for so EDH. EDH is the least expensive I find because you can just buy a pre-constructed deck at sixty to seventy dollars Canadian. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and would that be like compare enough for like? Not even EDH is not competitive. It's it, it's fun. It's kitchen table format. Yeah, but they have like high tier events to play, right? Uh, not really. Like well, I don't, they're, they're, they're not. They're, yeah, they're not very. It's you have terms with. I wouldn't call them tournaments as much as just days where people just come in and have organized just like an organized day they're still relaxed uh, they're still relaxed events okay. but uh, that $60 deck that you buy for EDH like you could actually like beat decks with like higher like pricing of that and totally yes you can okay. because there's EDH uh, or Commander as it's supposed to be called which I should I should call it Commander for now because that's the actual. I'm sorry, name that's of it. my fault. I keep calling yeah. it EDH. I'm like, Commander is played with. It. So unlike the other formats I mentioned before, which are one versus one in uh, naturally, Commander is a four-player free-for-all format. So even if you have uh, even if you have a, a pre-constructed bottom of the line deck, and other your, three other opponents are playing higher-level decks, they might they they might use resources on each other and it, like give you the opportunity to win with your deck. Oh, okay. Oh, that's good. And that's why I like Commander. So the people who are, the players who don't want to spend a lot of money can still enjoy the format. Alright, because that is one of like the formats I'm debating getting back into again. Especially maybe do like a progression like series of like magic. But uh, that's why I wanted to have like at least like more information on it and seeing like which format should be like the best to actually like start with if it's oh. be like back to Commander. Yeah, <laughs> Commander. Well, you asked me about all the magic formats and to name them all and I told you that I would I couldn't wait to talk about Commander as the last one. Yeah. Here we are. Uh, I can talk to you about this a lot. It's uh, not it's not a format I'm an expert in, but it's a format I love. Yeah, because I enjoyed it too. Like, uh, my deck was uh, Black and Green uh, Spirit, and my uh, commander was Glissa. Okay? And, like, the whole point of it was, like, you know, uh, Kamigawa, because I had, like, every card from Kamigawa, so that was, like, uh, I bought so many booster boxes of that, so, like, that was, like, the most, like, cards I have, and all, like, the Black and Green Spirits in that set was, like, amazing. So, like, that's was the first deck I built and I put like some little extra stuff like one of my biggest combo was to like do Inami the death aspect which sends like as many spirits as you want to the grave and then I would play like Mortal Kombat it's like if you have 20 more creatures on your next upkeep you win the game and that was like yeah that's favorite. what the card does yeah so that was like my favorite like combo it was like cool like a free win condition if it lasts on your next upkeep and you're like yeah the only issue is like, there was so many times it would never last, so like people would just like kill it like right before, and I'm like, oh man, but it was still pretty cool, or, oh, I forgot the other one, if it was like graveyard, a cemetery, it was the black card that brings back all your creatures. There's a lot of cards that do that. Uh, it's black, because that I had in all the creatures. Too. Yeah, because it was like, that was literally like my two like, win was pretty much uh, more combat or the other one and then like with like Inami the death 
aspect, and I have like all like the other like spirit stuff, or I had like cards that like kept on discarding cards from your opponent's hand. So if you send like a uh, spirit, your opponent has to discard one, and I had another one that if your opponent discards one, he has to take one damage, and I'm like, perfect. It was all like, what deck are you playing now for uh, Commander? Uh, so we just got back into that after the pandemic. I'm really just playing all pre-constructed decks. So my, my commander, my big commander deck, the only one I have is Marin of Clan Nell Pop, and this is a black green deck that uses that brings creatures back from the graveyard every turn. Oh, That's okay. what the commander does, but then I play out of my graveyard most of the time. I want to play out of my graveyard most of the time. You have a lot of commander deck? Uh for yeah, I have a lot of, well, I have a big collection playing for a long time. But I'm I only sure I would I, bring like two decks, yeah. so I'm like, damn, I wear a dual view. <laughs> I just I just have one commander deck, which is Marin, and that's my that's my deck. Oh okay. But I I also buy the pre constructed decks because they're they they're not powerful decks. I can play these with newer players, and the store I play at it's it, it's a lower it's not a competitive store, so I can play with the pre reconstructed decks and I can still do well with them. I can win games with them too. Because you don't, that's, and that's the beauty about Commander is you're not, you don't always have to build the most, the most expensive or the most powerful deck. It, it, magic is, you can say that for any Magic format, but Commander, it's always in, you're encouraged to build a deck you want to play, not the, you don't, you're not, you don't have to always build the most powerful deck for the format. No. There's, there's a deck for everyone. You just reminded me of something. So, uh, what is the idea of net decking? copying someone's deck online because now the biggest discussion that's been going on and I completely forgot about this is that somebody copyrighted the deck in Magic. I don't know if you heard about that. Okay, I've only heard about it for like a split second uh, in, a, in a messenger chat. I, I never looked into it. So far it's been like a lot of like like Yu-Gi-Oh players like thought that I've been like seeing on it like people like discussing about it but it's like, well, one, it's all Yu-Gi-Oh players, so I would really like a magic like perspective like on this. Like, what do you think of like copywriting your deck? What do you think of like the whole net decking? Because like a lot of people like some, it's like very encouraged because it gets people to be more competitive and be better with decks, especially if they're following like structured decks. But then you have some that are very much against it but it's much more of an older mentality that they have so what's your thoughts on like net decking and especially like copywriting a deck so i know that net decking not everybody will agree with me when i say that we we should be net decky because we get to see how other people build decks and how they wh why they're why that deck's winning and some because the, the deck that wins one week won't may come last might come in last place the week after so net decking won't always lead to you being victorious, but we'll, net decking will show you about you know what 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 decks work in the format. Because without net without net decking, without doing research, like, even if you're not net decking, you should at least be doing research online to to see what decks are out there. You can still play your deck, your home deck, a uh, homebrew. I, th I think the term is a homebrew. Never heard of homebrew. Like a homebrew deck, a deck that you think about at home that nobody else has. Oh, uh, I do that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much my own Even channel. if you're doing that, you should you still be going online to look at what decks you have to beat. Oh, so yeah, you, see, you have to tune. You have to always tune your deck to see what uh, what decks you need to beat. So net, I wouldn't say net decking is a bad thing. Well, I would say like the reason why I say it's an older mentality that's against it is because like back then. We didn't have like all these like platforms to actually look at decks and everything so everyone had to pretty much create their own decks and it was pretty much like thrown upon anyone that actually like looked uh, online for it or what was the uh... scry magazine yeah yeah there you go scry magazine there was another thing was it pojo no it wasn't pojo I only read Scry though. Yeah, no, but it was like two things. There was Scry, and then there was like an online uh, thing that everyone checked for like magic pricing and Yu Gi Oh! pricing as well. And Troll also, Toad? No, it wasn't Troll. It was before Troll Toad. It was oh like, boy. Yeah, oh, I can't remember. Like, I think it was like Pojo. No, uh, 
I totally forgot. It was like so. Old. It was like one of the. It was exactly like Scribe, but like online, and it was like the first uh, website. Like where it had like deck lists and everything, but like a lot of people got like very like mad when uh, they see people like net deck and everything. But like that's why like today it's very like common now that it's accepted. Yeah, and it's also more like how do you say it? like. Relax. Like it's not even intentional. Like the neck decking. Like I'll give you the best example. Like I do like deck profiles of my decks, okay? And realize and like it doesn't even occur that someone could just copy the same deck. But also I encourage people to like do that to like try it out. But it's more of the line. Like I do it so they get like a base. So they get like a base of like a deck, and then they can alternate it however they want to like fit like their play style, and, like that's it so like they could copy the whole deck if they like or they can change that as well but it comes to the point that now like with like youtube and all these platforms it's like you're not even net decking intentionally you just go on youtube and you just like scroll down and you see like a deck profile just pop out of nowhere you like just click as it interests you and then you're like shit this actually looks cool i want to try it out so now it's like much more like relaxed and like it's not even like too intentional like people don't even notice like that but uh, one thing that like shocked me was definitely the copyright thing, and I don't know like how much you know about like that copyright. Uh, I didn't read into it. When I heard about it, I thought at first, it, is this trolling? No, it was like legit, bro. Like <laughs> okay, I actually yeah. read like the whole thing. It is legit. Like, what Oof. the hell? But yeah, so a lot of people was discussing about like copywriting like the decks like for like Yu-Gi-Oh and like what people would do. But like me, I'm like just thinking in my head, I'm like. Who went to like that lawyer? Like, who was the lawyer? I would love to see like a videotape of like that interaction because like I can't picture someone going into like a law firm, going there and be like, okay, I want to copyright my magic deck, and the lawyer is just being like, well, what's magic? And then explaining, and then be like, okay, what's a deck? And be like, well, this is my deck list. Copyright the whole thing, and be like, okay, let's do it. Like. I would love to see that interaction. I'm like, yeah, I would pay money for that. But do you think like more Magic players would be doing that, or? Well, I know that players. Uh, I would assume players have looked into this now. Yeah. Who knows? It's ha it's it's happened now. Who knows what we could see next year? I can't believe that it's like even possible because one, it's like it's not even like their card. It's like wizards. It's their idea. Yeah, it's like, uh, what was it? It was uh, not the album. Like the pattern of the cards being together that they copyright. A deck list. Yeah. So, like that, I was like completely shocked about it. I'm like, damn. But, because they copyrighted against what? Posting the, a duplicate of the list online under your under your own name? No, uh, using it. Okay. That was uh, the whole thing is that other players cannot use his deck list. So like that's why I said like the pattern and not like the deck list is that your deck cannot have the specific pattern. Who's going to who's going to enforce this? Who's going to stop? Well, the that's why the issue with this, okay? Technically, anyone that's 17 of years of age and under could use this deck list and not get in trouble. They're not like bound to any like contract or anything like well, that. So like parents will. Mm -hmm. The guardian or the parents who signed their uh, release waiver to play in the big tournaments will. Yeah, that's a possibility. But, like, damn, I... It's just so dumb. I don't understand it. I'm like, shit. Imagine the money you have to pay to do that. Well, that's the thing. That's why I want to see the video of, like, the interaction. I'm like, bro, I think it would be the most funniest thing. Unless if it... You know what I think it is, honestly? I think it's the guy's friend. Like, it's, like, his friend that's a lawyer and, like very close want to do like this the copyright because i can't see how like a lawyer would like do this yeah like unless if they charge such like a really big like fee and the guy was like 100 percent doing it but like i can't see it like that i can see it, like the lawyer was his friend wanted to test it be like now let's see if it's possible took it to a judge judge signed it and be like shit it was Copyrights last forever. They have to be maintained. Every uh, they have to be uh, maintained. So usually they have like I don't know this per se, but like a lot of times it's uh, like four year or it depends on it. Like there's even like.
like, uh, and that's for, like, everything, even, like, Transformers, Gundams, like, all that, even for, like, characters, like, if they don't use it at a certain time period, then, uh, they could lose the license and someone else could pick it up. That's why, like, a lot of times, um, like, on the shows, they actually, like, rename another character as another name, even though it's the same person, but they change the name just so they don't lose the licensing on the names. Okay. So they still keep the names and everything, so that's why sometimes you're like, wait a man, this guy looks like this guy, but they both have two different names, but so they do that to, like, keep, like, the licensing. So, especially for this, I don't know, maybe he has to keep on using the deck and everything just to, like, keep it. Yeah, I don't see, like, in a, in a year from now, I don't see this still working. Like, if, if, if it catches on, that who knows what magic will look like, but I, I, I feel like this will not be an issue uh, in, like, a few years. But what format was that? I don't know. I didn't look into it. Because if it was standard, that would be pretty pointless to, uh... Well, standard rotates anyway, so... I know, like that's what I think. You're not, not going to bother renewing your copyright. It's just going to basically rotate out. Yeah, that's why I think it would be trucking hilarious. If it was like, oh, rotate it out. Damn, I can't use it. But no one could still use it. <laughs> I was like, oof. That would be funny. Oh. Alright, Eric. Sadly, that is time in the round. You have five uh, additional turns? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait. You guys still have five turns? Bro, like, uh, our time rule changed to actually now it's the phase. Okay. So, like, wherever the phase that you are on and the time rings, that's it. So, let's say you're at your upkeep and time goes. Okay. You can only play in your upkeep. So, if right. you have nothing, no instant or anything like that, you play, then you just can't play. So, they changed the rules and a lot of people are, like, frustrated about that. And especially that, like... When like phases are like changing, especially when people go to like the battle phase, they're trying to rush everything. But the issue why this is a problem is because to change phases, okay, you need consent from your opponent. So if you want to go from like your draw phase to your stamina phase or your main phase or your battle phase, which is the usual phase to deal damage, you always need consent to rotate out. So like the issue with like if you're about to hit time, there's only a couple of seconds left, you're in main phase, you're going to go into battle phase, and your opponent just says, no, I have a response. Well, you just hit time on your main phase, and now you can't feel down. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's been like an issue. I hope that a judge that sees that and say, hey, why are you stopping during that? You're trying to, you're trying to make your opponent uh, not... Well, the thing is, is that if he has a natural response, yeah. even if it's not like a relative response, let's say he just plays a card that is completely useless, does nothing, doesn't really change the game state, but it is an actual response, he could actually do that. It's not even like an issue, like, yeah, yeah. it's not a problem. But the thing that like sometimes it really sucks is like, like I was trying to go into my battle phase and my opponent's like, wait, what does that one do? By the time I explained it to him, I hit time in my main phase, I'm like, Okay, in that case, because, yeah. in Magic, if if a, if a player wasn't playing a card but was stopping play to run out the time by saying, asking questions they already knew the answers to, and we figured out that, and we would figure, and if we figured out that that player, we, the player was really up to, we'd kick him out of the tournament. Oh, but yeah? We're stalling. Ooh. You're not, you're not, in Magic, you are not allowed to, if you play slowly because you're taking too long naturally, that slow play, that's one thing. It's not, it's, it's a warning, it's not, it's, you're not out of the tournament, it's not illegal. But if you're if you're running out the clock on purpose to give your opponent less time to win, trying to let's say uh, get a draw or trying to end the game before your opponent can win, and uh, then it's you're stalling the clock. You're out of the tournament. You hear that, Konami? Good advice. But Sally, I have to thank you so much for coming to the show, and I really My hope pleasure. you come again because I definitely have some great ideas for you next time you come. So. I want to thank Eric for coming, and I hope all of you guys enjoyed the show as well. Till next time, 